Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately, but we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. Today we're in Acts chapter 20. We've been actually teaching through the book of Acts for uh, several months now. Um, And one of the things we we said at the front end of our study is that we were going to trace as a theme through the entire book every manifestation or every facet of the Holy Spirit's presence that we could see in the book. That We were intentionally going to have eyes to see that. Because that's what the book of Acts is. It's the story. It's, It's actually the sequel to Jesus' life. Um, our author is, the, is a guy named Luke. He's a doctor, a physician. He's named Luke. Uh, he wrote the book of Luke, and then he wrote Acts as the sequel. Part one was Jesus' story. Part two was Jesus' story continued, but now through his disciples, empowered by his spirit. A people filled with, anointed by, empowered by, surrendered to his spirit. And so, you know, one of the things we said is that we have language in church world for spirit-filled Christian. And different ones of us, depending on our background, depending on our theological background, our family of origin, uh, what part of the country we grew up in, different ones of us think different things. We have different connotations about what does it mean to be a spirit-filled Christian. And we said, let's, let's actually let this book, let's, let's let this living word of God shape our theology and then our experience of what it means to be a spirit-filled people. That we wouldn't limit it to just one or two facets of the Holy Spirit, but that we would be, we'd have a robust theology and a robust practice of, of being spirit-filled people. Um, you know, Jesus made some astonishing promises about the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of his people. And, uh, and so we want to we live in that to the fullness and grow and mature in that. So we're tracing that through a theme. And honestly, this morning we're in a passage, I, we're seeing a fast that I never would have seen here before. It's actually an answer to prayer for me personally, uh, the things that God brought out of this passage. So I hope you did your, your devotions this week. You know, our model is that Sunday doesn't stand alone. Sunday just is designed to supplement what's happening in our personal lives. And so we have devotions that Pastor Mike writes for us. They're at the back of the room. You can pick them up by the doors as you leave. You can sign up online to have them emailed to you each morning. But they prepare us, they have us in the passage before we get here on Sunday, so that God's the first one to speak to us, to shape our hearts and minds out of a a particular passage we're going to be in. I hope you did your work this week, because we're actually not going to be in in chapter 20 very much. We're going to be in like the first six verses. And it's a rich passage. There's a lot of stuff we could have, a lot of places we could have gone. But I want to zero in on one facet of the Holy Spirit that I've never seen as a manifestation of being a spirit-filled people of God that I think God has for us this morning. So um, we left last week with Paul in Ephesus. He was on his third missionary journey. To our knowledge, according to the book of Luke, we only know of three missionary journeys that Paul took. We know he wanted to do one more, that he wanted to go to Rome. Luke ends his story before we find out you know, whether or not Paul actually got to do that last missionary journey. Uh, He does end up in Rome, but under different circumstances than a missions trip. So uh, we left off at the end of his, towards the end of his third missionary journey. He'd spent three years in a place in Asia called Ephesus. Uh, Typically, he hadn't spent that much time in one place. That was the longest time he rooted down in one place because it was at a major crossroads. He was able to impact a lot of the, the, the world right there of Asia Minor just by staying in one place. And so... We picked up, or we left off last week, there'd been this big riot in Ephesus because Paul's um, preaching of the gospel had reached so many people and transformed so many lives that the economy of Ephesus was actually impacted, that it began to change the way people spent their money, that businesses they used to frequent, they were no longer frequenting, and actually the economy began to feel a difference. And so the people that were part of those businesses that were being impacted, they weren't very happy about that. And so last week we saw a two-hour riot where people were rioting against Paul. And at the end of that, Paul decided, you know what, maybe we should move on. That's where we're picking up. Actually, before we, before we go there, um, Paul had actually, Luke had telegraphed earlier in chapter 19 while Paul was in Ephesus, or Ephesus uh, of, of what he was going to do. He talked about his travel plans. Uh, so I want to read that briefly because this is pretty important. This is Acts 19. We covered this last week. 
After these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, after I've been in Jerusalem, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Okay? So when it says that he stayed in Asia, that means Ephesus. Um, What's not so clear in, in just that reading, when you just read it and you see the words, what's not clear is that Paul is not being very efficient in his travel plans. Okay? For those of you who, uh, who, li- who remember a world of going on road trips prior to having Siri to guide you, um, th- this is not a AAA endorsed travel plan. Hmm? For those of you who only know Siri guiding you through strange cities, um, this is not, one, this is not a, a travel option that Siri would have ever offered if you were trying to start in Ephesus and end up in Rome. Okay, look at a map real quick. Ephesus is, uh, if you look at the very middle of the map and just up and to the left a little bit, is the city of Ephesus. It's right on the coast. Um, where he wants to go is Rome. Rome is actually, if, it's not even on the map. It's way to the left. It's, it's way west. It, he wants to end up in Rome. But first he's going to go to Jerusalem, which is down to the right, uh, clear down, down uh, southern right. And before he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to cross the Aegean Sea and go over to Macedonia and Achaia. So if you think about the travel plans, he's starting in Ephesus, he's going to do this. He's going to go up and then down and then way out. He's just zigzagging all over the Roman world. And that's time-consuming. Yeah, this, this is not 21st century travel. This is first century. So that means when he's on land, he's on foot. That means when he's uh, on the ocean, he's in ships that, that don't know the shipping channels the way that we do. Sh- going in a ship was actually quite dangerous, as was going on land because of robbers and thieves. So Paul, he, when he talks about his travel journey, he says, when I'm traveling, I'm in danger all the time. And so what in the world is he doing when he's zigzagging all over the map? Like, what's that about? That's what we find out today. Acts 20. After the uproar had ceased, that's the riot, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell, and he departed into Macedonia. When he'd gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. Okay, Greece is Corinth. There's a little cross-reference there for you in Corinthians. Um, Before he'd left to come to to Corinth, he'd written to them and said, here's my plan. Uh, I want to come see you before I go to Jerusalem. Uh, I'm going to travel on land through Macedonia and Achaia, and then I'm going to come to you, and I'm hoping to spend the winter with you. Okay? That was in uh, in 1 Corinthians. Now, that's the letter that we have known as Corinthians. Uh, He reaches Corinth, verse, verse 3. There he spent three months. That's that winter he was talking about. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, he was about to set sail for Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, there was Aristarchus and Secundus, uh, Gaius of Derb, and Timothy, and the Asians, uh, of the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, And in five days, we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. This is God's word. We're going to stop there today. And um, that's as much of Acts 20 as we're going to be in today. Um, Again, we're tracing this theme. And, uh, you know, to be honest, previously, I would have just skipped over this. This is just the travel log. It's just Paul's itinerary and his missions team. He names the missions team like we did today, you know. Um, He just names the missions team like just, you know, you get through that, get to the good stuff. And there's some really good stuff. Right? There's a story about a guy named Eutychus who um, Paul preaches for a long time, like, like really a long time. And Eutychus falls asleep and falls out the window three stories and dies. And then Paul prays over him and he comes back. Okay? We could spend some time there today. Um, Paul also visits the uh, Ephesian leaders. That, you know, after he'd spent three years in Ephesus, he left. He sailed past Ephesus and he, he stopped on the coast on his way back to Jerusalem and had a really rich uh, meeting with the leaders of the Ephesian church, telling them some things that he th- saw on the horizon for them that they needed to be aware of if they were going to, to lead the church effectively. And then he said this incredibly tearful goodbye where he says goodbye to this, this cross-cultural church that he'd planted. And it's, and it's a tearful goodbye on his side and there. So very rich stuff. We're not going to go there. There's a hidden manifestation of the Holy Spirit in this passage 
that we only really discover when we, um, when we go to the additional places. When we read Paul's letters, we kind of get the other pieces of the story to find out what is this, why is he zigzagging all over the Roman world? Why is he taking the time to do this? Uh, so for example, if you look at Romans 15, uh, Romans 15, well, the letter to Rome, uh, Paul wrote while he was in Corinth. He's sitting in Corinth for three months that winter. He writes a letter to Rome, and this is what he says. But now I've finished my work in these regions, and after all these long years of waiting, I'm eager to visit you. Paul, had, Paul hadn't been to Rome yet. He was writing a letter to Christians that, that he hadn't met yet. I'm eager to visit you. I'm planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I will stop off in Rome. And after I've enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. <laughs> Stakes or something, I don't know. Um, but before I come, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. We're finding out why he's making this journey in the opposite direction to get to Jerusalem. I'm taking a gift to the believers there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Let me read that again. The believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem, they feel the least they can do in return is to help them financially. As soon as I've delivered this money and completed this good deed of theirs, I will come to you and see you on my way to Spain." And I'm sure that when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. So what exactly is Paul doing? He's cultivating racial reconciliation within the first century Christian churches. Um, He's gathering a financial offering from the predominantly Gentile churches of Galatia, Macedonia, and Achaia. Those are regions. He's gathering uh, an offering from the predominantly Gentile churches to be given to the predominantly Jewish churches of Judea. Yeah, the churches of Judea, specifically Jerusalem, but they had been impacted by a series of famines at this time. And so that especially impacted the poor. And so Paul is, he's off in Asia Minor and over in Macedonia, and he's taking up an offering to be given to the poor there near, near Jerusalem. Not only that, Paul's, he's traveling with a very diverse team. When in that, as Luke named all the team members, those were team members. They were both Jews and Gentiles, and that's, that's the two people groups of the first century in, in this part of the world. It was Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and Greeks. And, he, and, and this team is made up of both Jews and Greeks, and they're from lots of different nations, lots of different cities, different regions, some from Asia, from uh, Galatia, from Macedonia, from Achaia, and from Israel. So he's traveling with a diverse group. So here's what you see is in a world rooted and steeped in racism, in a world steeped in generational hostility between both Jews and Gentiles, Paul is very intentionally nurturing a new posture, one that is not just the absence of hostility toward one another, but of actively loving one another, leaning into and valuing one another. You know, Paul says, uh, the, to the Gentiles, he says, you've been blessed by the spiritual heritage of the Jewish nation. That was actually the call on the Jewish nation from the very beginning. When God spoke to Abraham and said, out of you, I'm going to make a great people, and through you, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. Well, effectively, Paul's saying to these churches that he's planting, he's saying, you are the recipients of a, of a blessing that God's been doing uh, for, for thousands of years, and you're the recipients of it. And because you're experiencing the blessing of their spiritual heritage, they have a need. Would you provide for them out of your financial resources? And that's kind of surprising if you consider Paul's background. Again, going to Paul's letters in uh, his letter to the church in, in Philippi, which there's, there's people on his missions team from Philippi. They're one of the ones that sent an offering. And they sent an offering that they couldn't afford to send. These were not wealthy churches. The, the, the Philippian church actually gave out of their own need, but they gave to meet the needs of a people group that previously they'd been separated from. Think about Paul's background, though. Here's when he writes to the Philippians. He's describing his life prior to coming to know Jesus, prior to putting his faith in Jesus. He said, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That was the kingly tribe. That was, you know, they're the very first king in Israel of the 12 tribes. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. So this is the tribe of royalty. Of the people of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul's describing his identity, his, his worldview about himself and the world that he lived within before he became a Christian. And he basically, if we were to convert that into our own language, he was ethnocentric, he was born into privilege, he was proud, he was self-righteous, he was a religious zealot, and he was actively persecuting those who believed differently. He was trying to purify his own race. That's, that's Saul before he has an encounter with Jesus. And you think about that, and you think about, about who he was and the fact that he, Gentiles weren't even a part of his world because he just simply wouldn't have even thought about them. He was focused on trying to purify his own race. And now he's spending his life, risking his life, traveling all over the world at great risk to himself in order to serve these people by bringing them the gospel. And not only to, to personally serve them out of, out of a, a heart that's been transformed, not only is he serving them, but now he's helping them to lean into their, their new Jewish family. He's, help, he's helping these people to value one another. It's not just the absence of, of hostility. It's the choice to intentionally love and be reconciled. Paul's risking his life uh, on a people group that he would have previously scorned and avoided. And to do this, he's literally putting his life on the line. Not only is the travel dangerous, but he, as he talks to the Ephesian elders, I remember I, I just said that he, as he's sailing past Ephesus, he stops on the coast. He says goodbye to the leaders of the church there. He has a speech with them, and here's what he says to them. Now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, Okay? This, is a, this is a work of the Spirit in, in Paul's heart. Make no mistake. Constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace, the undeserved, ill-deserved favor of God. Paul says, I'm doing this at great risk. Why is he going to Jerusalem? If he, if he, if he really wants to go evangelize Rome, why is he taking the risk to go to Jerusalem first? Because he's compelled to bring this offering. And, he's, and, he, and what we know in the text is he urgently wants to get there in time for their, the, the feast that's coming up. He wants to reach there by Pentecost because Pentecost is when people from all over the known world, Jews from all over, would descend on Jerusalem in order to, to worship together in Jerusalem. And he wants this offering from the Gentile churches of Asia Minor to have maximum impact. He wants them to have maximum visibility. So he's, he's like, I've got to deliver this when people are going to see it. Not because it's about him, but he wants them to see racial valuing. He wants to come against the wound of racism. And he's doing something very different. That's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in this week's passage. And I would suggest it's as relevant today in 21st century America, here in Vineyard Boise, as it was in the first century world. You know, in the last you know, few years, we've seen this rising surge of racial tension, racial violence. Uh, we've seen uh, all kinds of just ugliness. We've seen prejudice. Uh, it's always been there. It's, it's come to the surface, and it's very visible right now. And I've been lovingly challenged by some, in the last several months, by, by friends that we need to take up this issue of racial reconciliation and to lead the way in it. Um, for my part, I would say that I've been content to address the issue. I, I uh, believe that that's, racism is not God's heart. Uh, I've been content to address it when it comes up in whatever passage we're in, and uh, and I, but I haven't felt the urgency that I think I would if I was living in one of those cities where we've seen um, the visible race problems. If I was pastoring in a city where there was uh, gun deaths uh, based, you know, that were racially motivated, where there was rioting that was uh, racially motivated. If we were living in one of those cities, I think as a pastor, I would feel more compelled to address it. But in all honesty, I, I haven't experienced a lot of racism in Boise, so it hasn't felt to me like a pressing issue. And I've had some friends lovingly challenge me on that. I have a growing conviction that we need to be as intentional in this area of seeing God's will established here on earth as we would any other. 
Remember, what did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? They said, would you teach us how to pray and how to, how to have an effective prayer life that would guide us in a daily way? And so he, say, he said, give us this day our daily bread. This is a daily prayer. He said, may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So much of what we do is motivated by saying, we know what it's going to look like, we, or at least we have a, a, an idea of what it will look like when God's kingdom is fully established here on earth. We know that, that all creation has been under the power of sin and death ever since our first parents rebelled against God in the garden, that we rejected his good leadership. And so we experience the, the, the savaging of, of just sin and death, but we know what it's going to look like when God's kingdom is fully established. And so what do we do? Well, when there's people that are hungry, we feed the poor. When there's people that are sick, we pray for them and we see them healed and we have a medical clinic. When there's disasters that are motivated by a creation that's spinning out of control and we have hurricanes, we send teams into, into places to do disaster relief. All of those are manifestations of, of saying, may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. When we, when we preach the gospel of, of repentance and faith in Jesus that brings forgiveness and new life, that's, that's acting as if we're seeing God's kingdom come here on earth. And in the same way, when God's kingdom comes here on earth, there, there's not going to be these racial divides. In fact, there's going to be a, a beautiful harmony of the races. I was thinking about this this week. I was, I was out raking my yard, think, and I was, I was listening to a podcast on this very issue. And I'm thinking about just the beauty of fall. It, hands down, everybody likes fall as, as the favorite season, right? Few of you like winter. Some of you like summer. The popular one, the right one is fall, okay? <laughs> But isn't there something majestic about seeing a tree that previously was just a green tree, see it be green, yellow, orange, rust, and red all at once? I just look at that and go, oh, that is so beautiful. That's the diversity of our creator. And when God's kingdom comes on earth, when God's kingdom is fully established, here's what it's going to look like. John gives us a picture. John is one of Jesus' closest friends. Um, he's the last of the apostles that's alive. Uh, he writes the book of Revelation towards the end of his life. He's an old man. He's been banished to an island. And while he's on that island, one Sunday morning, he has a vision of what it will be like when God's kingdom is fully established on earth as it is in heaven. It looks like this. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The Revelation is a, it's a vision. It's, uh, it's full of imagery. It's apocalyptic. It's weird at times. I don't know, if it, I don't, I don't know exactly what eternity looks like, but, but here's the imagery. It's of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation together worshiping God. That's God's kingdom here on earth. When we do that, we're, we're, we're seeing God's kingdom come. So I believe that we should be as actively pursuing racial unity and love, healing the divide in our nation, in our world, as we are about feeding the hungry or taking relief to Puerto Rico. But unfortunately... Though that's God's call on us, that's not how our neighbors, our, our American neighbors perceive us. Here's, here's just a, a quick snapshot. 42% of Americans believe that people of faith, and an even higher figure, 46%, believe that religion are part of the problem, not the solution, when it comes to the significant issues and the direction of our country. There's, there's a world that knows, I mean, we all know that our country is in trouble, that there's a, some troubling dynamics within our country right now. And what's the answer to those things? And 46% of the world think that we're actually part of the problem, not the solution. That, that should break our hearts. When Jesus said to the disciples, they will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. We're to be known by our love, not that we're part of the problem that's feeding hate and prejudice. So how do we do that? Where do we start? Well, first of all, clearly in one morning, we're not going to heal generational problems, problems that are at the, at the heart of the, the sinful human heart. We're not going to be able to heal that in one morning, but, but how do we move forward? Let me just suggest two things. One is it takes humility. We need a spirit-empowered humility to listen to and value the experiences and perspectives of people different than ourselves. You know, Paul, 
Saul had an encounter with God. God said, uh, Saul, you've, you've been on this trajectory in your life, and I'm going to send you a different direction. I'm going to send you to people that you scorned previously, and I want you to be a blessing to them. And then Saul disappears. We don't hear from Saul for the most part for the next 14 years. But 14 years later, he emerges as a man with a completely different heart and a, and a completely different posture towards people. Not, not just a, a heart, but his, it shows up in his actions. The, the, the Saul that we have in this passage, the Paul we have in this passage, very different than the one that he describes in Philippians. So we need to be, be, be willing to enter into a process that we would intentionally let God form our hearts and our practice in this area as well. As a white man born and raised in Boise, Idaho, I don't know what I don't know. The reality is I haven't felt a depressing need in our city, in our community, because I haven't experienced racism. But the reality is I haven't walked in other people's skin. I heard, I heard somebody say this summer in talking about racial issues, he said, you know what? No matter what skin color you have, you are not the expert on someone else's experience. And so if you've never experienced racism, that doesn't mean it exists. It just means that you haven't experienced it. And it takes humility to enter into somebody else's story and to say, would you tell me what it's like to live in your skin, to raise your children? What are the fears that you have? What are you, how do you experience our city? How do you experience our church? How do you experience our friendship? That takes humility. We need to find opportunities to listen to others so that we learn to both think better and act better on this issue. It requires an investment of time and likely some discomfort. It, it, it takes time to understand from somebody else's perspective. It, it's, that can be an uncomfortable conversation. But look at the discomfort that Paul's experiencing in order to, to intentionally pursue racial reconciliation. Look what he's, he's, he's experiencing, this incredibly time-consuming travel. He's putting his life at risk. Can we enter into a conversation with somebody that's uncomfortable where we say, you know what? Um, I don't know what it's like to be you. I don't know what it's like to raise your kids. I don't know what it's like to, to, to drive in our city. I don't know what it's like to shop. Could, could you just share with me what it's like? It's also going to take a, a broadening. We need to broaden our understanding of the problem and the ways in which prejudice can manifest. You know, it's easy for me to let, let myself off the hook as not part of the problem because I don't, I don't have a white hood in my closet. I'm not part of the clan. I'm not, part of, I'm not one of those guys. See, the, the type of racial problems that, that drove the civil rights movement, that stuff, it's easy to recognize that stuff out there and we would all denounce that. And then it's, because I'm not part of that, it's easy for me to let myself off the hook and think, well, I'm not part of the problem. I love people. I love people of every color and race. But God, is there something in me? I think that's the question we need to ask. Just because I'm not hostile to others doesn't mean I'm not part of the problem. God has more for us. that He would call us to not just be indifferent on this topic, but to be intentional healers. Let me say that again. God would have for us more he wants more for us than to, to just uh, us to, to, to be neutral. It's not enough to just not be part of the problem. We need to be actively part of the solution. We need to understand concepts like implicit racial bias, not the explicit sort of prejudice that was at the heart of the civil rights movement, but the unexamined biases that everybody has, every people group. We're, we have we have implicit bias that we don't even question at times. It's just there, but it it shapes the way we behave. It's the unexamined bias that we all have that become the seeds of prejudice that racism can bloom from. So intentional reconciliation, what can we do? I'm going to give you one thing, a homework assignment this week. And if you're ready to take a teachable posture, to think better, to act better, there's lots of people that are actively working towards this for Christians that are saying, how can, we, how can we be part of the solution? How can we be part of seeing God's kingdom come here on earth as it relates to issues of racism and prejudice? There's people that are thinking well about this, and they're trying to host conversations to just help us understand better. If you, if you are willing to take a teachable posture, to take an investment of time, I'd like, I want you to get out your phone. I'm not going to ask you to erase something. I'm sorry I did that last time. <laughs> this is going to be more productive. Get out your phone and text the word reconciliation to 33733. 
okay? 33733. Here's what you're going to get. You're just going to get a text back that gives you a link to a podcast. It's a 45-minute podcast from an organization called Q. Uh, Q is a Christian organization started by a great guy, Gabe Lyons. His heart is to empower and equip the church to not just impact people individually, but to impact our culture, to be, to be uh, agents of, of, of healing and seeing God's kingdom come within our culture. So it's really, it's a, you may not agree with everything. You may find parts of it uncomfortable. I would encourage you to listen to it all the way to the end because it ends really, really well. Um, and, it's, and it's just a good investment. And what I would ask you to do is listen to it with the Holy Spirit as your guide. Um, just say, you know, it, it, again, it's easy for us to let ourselves off the hook no matter what color our skin is, no matter what our background is. It's easy to let ourselves off the hook and, and say, well, I'm not the problem. But what if I am? What if there's, there's the seeds that could blossom and, and bloom into something in my heart? And we need to deal ruthlessly with those things. This week, I was, I've listened to this podcast multiple times. I think probably three times I've listened to it. I was listening to it again this week. I was out in my yard doing yard work. And I just prayed and said, God, would you show me my heart? Would you show me uh, the, the, the places where I'm not experiencing the fullness of what you would have for me? Places where I'm, I have biases towards others. I don't, I don't think I have any, but would you show them to me? In that afternoon, I went to Home Depot. I had a, a, a project I was working on. I got stuck. I, I didn't know my way forward. I'd, I'd been working on a project, and I, I needed to talk to somebody. When I get there, I go to, to Home Depot and look for Robert. Robert is this older guy that has coached me through many projects. And he helps me figure out the right tools and tells me what to do, and he's helped me avoid some problems. And so I'm, I'm looking for Robert. So I'm walking through Home Depot. I'm looking up and down the aisles, looking for Robert specifically, but also just looking for any Home Depot employee. I get all the way to the end, to the, uh, the lumber section, and I haven't seen anybody, and then I see one Home Depot employee. And it's somebody from a racial minority group. And in a split second, less than a second, I had the thought, oh, he can't help me. And, and I was just starting to turn and go the other direction. And it wasn't a conscious thought. It was, there might be a language barrier there. It's probably not his department. He's probably not trained for that. It just happened in a split second. And as I was starting to turn, he looked over at me and said, hey, can I help you? And I said, yeah, uh, well, here's what I'm looking for. And he said, oh, okay, come here. And he walked me through the whole thing like Robert would have. And I thanked him, and I just walked away and said, oh, God, you know, that, there it is in my heart. There's the bias that I don't recognize that just happened in a split second, and God, will you forgive me? But I tell you what, if I hadn't been listening to this podcast, if I hadn't been participating in some things like this, I wouldn't have been open to it. And before we can help people out there, we've got to deal with it in us. Before Paul could help the Macedonians and the Ephesians, he had to deal with it in his own heart. I don't know what that looked like in those 14 years that he was away, but the Holy Spirit transformed Paul's heart of stone into a heart of flesh and gave him the capacity to love people. We close with one story. It's a picture. This is a a racial reconciliation walk that actually happened last Sunday afternoon. Uh, this was a gathering, about 40 people, about 20 churches were represented. And uh, we walked from St. Paul's Baptist Church to, uh, to North End Collective, a predominantly black church to a predominantly white church. And along the way, we were just praying prayers. God, help us to see ourselves, help us to see the problem, help us to see what's going on in our community, help us to be part of the solution. And... Uh, and so for me to, to have actually seen this in this passage was an, actually an answer to prayer on Monday that I was praying on Sunday. So God's just awesome. <laughs> but, but I want to tell you how this was started. It was started by Jen Bakerstaff. Jen uh, is married to Ben. Ben's the worship pastor at, uh, at North End Collective. Jen um, was watching stuff play out in the news uh, last year and just was grieved by the, the, the wound in our nation of racism and prejudice and how it was hurting. And she just, just had to do something. She was so grieved by it. So she just went to St. Paul's and knocked on the door and said, when they answered, she said, what can we do? And out of that, groups from both churches started getting together and just trying to understand one another better. It was awkward at first. It was hard. She said it, it was really forced. But out of it, it grew this movement where they called other churches and said, would you come walk with us? I tell you that because I believe there's gens in this church that can take point for us on this, that can help us figure out how to think better, 
act better and, and recognize opportunities in our city and our community to do better with this. And if that's you, if you have a heart like Jen, I just want to tell you, please chase that and help us do better with it. In closing, we're going to receive communion, and I've asked uh, Amber. Amber's our, our, one of our pastors here. Amber is, uh, she is over spiritual formation is specifically what, what she's doing, and um, I asked her if she would lead us in uh, communion, uh, specifically thinking about this issue. So would you welcome Pastor Amber? Trevor and I talked this week a little bit about the direction he was going, and um, so I, I knew a little bit, but um, first service, uh, sitting in and listening to it, I was, I was pretty undone um, at this point, so being second service, you have the benefit of, of my a little bit more collected <laughs> thoughts. Um, I grew up in Colorado. I grew up in a, in a more diverse area um, than Boise happens to be, um, and so I, I benefited from that exposure to other cultures. Um, but a, about 10 years ago, um, this issue really came home for me and for my husband. And um, we, um, we have four children. Two of our children are adopted, and they are a different race. And, um, and you know, there's, there's all kinds of things we could talk about with adoption, and it's, it's not all roses. There's a, there's a great deal of grief and loss there. But there's also something really beautiful. And um, so when I say that this came home for me, all of a sudden this wasn't an issue just out there. This was an issue that I was, that had a face on it for me. Um, you know, there were members of my extended family, older members that, that I had grown up hearing. I had grown up hearing those implicit and not so <laughs> implicit biases. But all of a sudden, I had a child, and this child had a beautiful face, and I watched transformation in my own family because it wasn't out there anymore. It was staring them in the face. Um, and so let me be clear, and I didn't say this first service, let me be clear about this. I'm still a white woman experiencing the world as a white woman. But I now have children that I see. I see some of this through their eyes, and it grieves me because they're little and they're just starting to see it. And it is in Boise. And it is sometimes under the surface. And it actually makes it harder to know how to handle it because it's not, it's not so in your face that you're clear on that's wrong. But it is here. And there does need to be humility and a change in our hearts. And so that's our prayer this morning and, and that's our invitation and as God would have it, we get to participate in communion with this issue in mind, with this invitation. So we're going to do that. Um, you know, Paul talks, talks a lot about unity. He talks about unity when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, when he's writing to the church in Corinth. In, in Ephesians 2, he's talking about, you know, in, in that context, as Trevor said, their racial issues were, were around Jewish and non-Jewish. So that's, that's the language he uses. He says, It was only yesterday that you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this. You didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel, hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. But now, because of Christ, dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it altogether are now in on everything. The Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall that we use, used to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. And then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. And Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. 
the cross got us to embrace. And that was the end of the hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. So if you'll stand with me, um, as we participate in communion, there's, there's an element of communion, um, there's an element of ex examination. It is an opportunity to examine our hearts. And this is a perfect opportunity to, to do that. So as you, as you make your way to the tables, I'm gonna ask you um, to open your heart to the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I specifically, I know for me, I said, God, would you give me just a face? Make it personal for me. Give me a face or maybe a specific situation that was in the past um, or that I might be encountering. God, give me a face. Give me a situation. And, and, and I don't want you to do this in a sense of, of thinking about or asking, well, what do I do? What do I, what's the action? I just want you to ask for the heart of God. In sitting with that face and in looking into those eyes, would you ask for the heart of God toward that person, toward that situation? Because none of this changes without a heart change. This isn't just behavior management. We really do need a heart change. So as you go to the tables, would you just ask the Holy Spirit to give you that image? And then when you come back to your seats, we'll take communion together. Sometimes with communion, we, we talk about it as a means of grace. It is a sacrament, it is a means of grace. And there is an element of this, our own natural bent, our natural tendency is towards division. That's part of that, that kingdom breaking in. What's, what's here is, is division, it's not unity. So we do need that means of grace, we need the incarnation of Christ. And that's, communion reminds us of that. It reminds us of the incarnation of Christ in us. And it is that means of grace that even makes us capable of this kind of heart change. When Paul was instructing the Corinthians in chapter 11, he's, he's saying, 
I received my instruction from the master himself, and I'm passing it on to you. The master Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, when we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him. God, that is our prayer. Jesus, that we would be so full of you, so full of your spirit, that what comes out is unity. God, unity and humility, a willingness to listen. God, in a deep, deep desire to see your kingdom come. To pursue that image of, of wholeness and oneness. Would you do that in us, God? Give us a soft heart. When I was praying this week and thinking about how I wanted to close, God reminded me of, of something that I've done with my kids. And um, I love to have a visual representation of what God is teaching me. It's really, really meaningful to me. And he reminded me of this little raggedy strip of cloth. It has two little slip knots at either end. And um, so with all, all of my kids, you know, they're just normal siblings, and uh, they fight. <laughs> they fight all the time. But when they were little, what I would do when they were just, it wasn't, when I could sense it wasn't even about circumstances, they were just kind of at each other. I would, I would give them warnings and talk to them, but at a point, I was just at my wit's end, and I'd say, okay, okay, that's it. You guys are, you're going to be stuck together. And so I'd slip one of these little <laughs> loops around each of their wrists. And instead of being at each other, all of a sudden they were joined. They were stuck together. And every single time, without fail, it amazed me because instead of being at each other, they were all of a sudden on the same team. Because if they were gonna go anywhere or do anything, they had to figure it out, how to do it together. And instead of them being in conflict, all of a sudden it was like they were on a team and they were gonna show mom, you know, that, that they could do it, that they could play, that they could run outside. It was just a beautiful image and it never failed to work. So I'm gonna, you know, Trevor said, this is uncomfortable, it's awkward. And I thought, well, I'm gonna make it uncomfortable this morning. <laughs> I'm gonna make you stand up and I'm gonna make you hold hands. And it doesn't have to get weird, like we have to be this one giant thing, joined thing, but just grab the hand of somebody. And as you go, I want you to take this image with you. And maybe even picture that face as we pray, the face that the Holy Spirit gave you of someone in your life that you found that implicit bias, 
or someone in your life that, that you really desire more unity with, um, maybe hold that, that image in your mind as we pray and as you feel what it's like to be joined. Because there's something powerful about, about how that feels. So God, would you join us together? Not just in this place, not just in Vineyard Boise, but everywhere we go. Would you join us together in unity? And God, we recognize that this, this bond is love. Love is what binds us together. So God, would you plant that deep in our hearts? Would you give us a hunger for love, for reconciliation? And would we carry that with us as we go? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We do have some words for prayer. So if you... Um, if you see your need up there, if you see yourself represented, would you please come get prayer? We do have a prayer team um, that would love to meet with you in prayer. Go in love.